All right, everyone. We just learned in previous lectures that we use matrices to encode these ideas of translating the vectors, rotating vectors, scaling vectors. So by multiplying these matrices by our original vector, we just go there, we change the x's, y, and z's by doing this multiplication, and we scale, rotate, translate, we perform those transformations, right? Those affine transformations. Very well. But the thing is, I told you that we can use also a matrix to represent that projection phase. Remember where we have all these objects in the world space? We want to go and project everything into this 2D screen, into our image space, into our screen space. I am claiming that we can use a matrix as well. We're going to find all the correct values to populate this projection matrix. So we go, we multiply by every vector that we have, achieving perspective projection. Well, it doesn't have to be perspective. You can have different matrices for different things. You could have a matrix that performs an orthographic type of projection. So we have different values here that we have to populate. You have perspective projection, of course. This is the one we're going to learn. But if you have a different type of projection that you want to achieve, if you have the correct values, you can just go populate and achieve that projection by creating a matrix for that thing. So we are going to look at perspective projection, right? This is the one that we're implementing right now. But I'm going to tell you something. Perspective projection matrix, there are several different goals. There are several objectives that we can achieve by using a perspective projection matrix. So far, the perspective that we have been achieving is very, is what we call weak projection, which it doesn't take into account anything else other than perspective divide. We need to take into account, and a projection matrix is responsible for three important things. So there are three steps that the projection matrix is going to help us achieve. The first one is accounting for the aspect ratio of our monitor, our screen, right, the device. So the, the projection matrix, we are going to use the projection matrix to adjust the x and y values, we're going to shrink or grow the x and y values based on our screen width and height dimensions. Right? So we have the width, the height, the resolution. Different monitors, different devices have different resolutions, they have different aspect ratios. Uh, some monitors are 16 by 10, others are 16 by 9, uh, others are 4 by 3, right? Whenever we were programming in MS-DOS back in the day, we didn't have to worry too much. Everyone, every user that is going to play your game was going to play in a 4 by 3 uh, aspect ratio. But now, with different monitors, different drivers, different devices, we have to take into account this aspect ratio. Right, so that is the first task of the perspective projection matrix. We have to use the perspective projection matrix to encode and to adjust the x and y values to take into account the aspect ratio. Right. The second task is to take into account the field of view. When I say field of view, is the angle of opening, right? So if we're talking about perspective projection, we have this angle of opening, which we're going to perceive the objects in front of us. What is that opening? What is that angle of the field of view? Is it 60 degrees? Is it 90 degrees? So we're going to see less or more of the objects based on this field of view angle. So we're going to adjust the x and y values based on this field of view angle as well. This is another thing that we have to take into account, and our perspective projection matrix is going to help us do that. The third thing, and which is probably the most important thing that I think is what we call normalization of our values. When I say normalization, is usually we're going to go and map those values, right? So we have all these objects in world space. They have different x coordinates, different z coordinates, y coordinates. I want to normalize all these values. I want to adjust x's and y's and z values to seat, to map everything in this range between minus one and one. Which means that after we go and we perform the perspective divide, I want to end up with what we call image space, which is this almost like a cube that has all these values of x, y, and z between minus one and plus one. 
this imaginary cube-like thing with all these coordinates normalized between minus 1 and 1 in x, y, and z. This is what we call normalized device coordinates. If you ever read a book or read an article that they mention the NDC, this normalized device coordinates, it means these coordinates, these vertices, after perspective divide. Well, let me rephrase that. After projection and after perspective divide, right? We have to project them and divide by that z component so we get this normalized between minus one and one cube like thing. This is what we call image space. Right, so these are the three tasks that we're going to have to achieve. Let's start looking at them one by one, right? Let's just look at the easiest one, which is the aspect ratio. Look, aspect ratio is not hard to understand, it's just the ratio between the width and the height, or the height and the width, depending on how we want to look at things. Let's just go ahead and say that our aspect ratio, what I'm calling A, is the ratio between the height divided by the width of our monitor resolution. This is going to give us a value of A, and then let's just think about what that means in terms of adjusting and modifying the values of our original vertex. If I have my original vertex in world space, to get this conversion from world space to what I call screen space or image space, I need to multiply my axis by that aspect ratio. And in this case, it's just axis, right? Because I just want to kind of shrink things or grow things based on that aspect ratio, since my aspect ratio is height divided by the width in this case. All good? So, Keep this in mind, right? This thing right here where we are multiplying this aspect ratio scaling factor, we have to multiply the original axis by this scaling factor. Keep this in mind, we're going to revisit this very soon. This is going to be part of our projection matrix, right? So this is aspect ratio. The next thing I want to look is field of view. Again, it's not hard either. It's just that we have to look at that field of view angle and based on how we kind of open that field of view, is it 60 degrees, is it 90 degrees? You can pick what is the field of view opening, right? So how much do we see? Opening that angle, we have to look at it almost like zooming out and zooming in, right? How much we can see of the objects in our screen. So we have to find also a scaling factor for the field of view. And this scaling factor, we are going to multiply the x's and y's to grow the x's and y's or shrink the x's and y's, depending on how big or how small that field of view really is. Right, so given that we want, right, if we have this world space, this is almost like this minus 1 to plus 1, and then we want to kind of project everything right here. The field of view that we have right here, we need to kind of shrink or grow these objects and these vertices based on this field of view angle. How do we get this scaling factor? Well, the way I look at it, right, since we have this, it's almost like we have this triangle right here. And if we look, we can kind of divide this triangle in two, we're going to have these two right triangles, and then we're probably going to have to divide this angle by two as well, so we have half of the field of view and half of the field of view here. What we are really interested in, right, if we look at those dimensions, we can kind of think of it as the ratio between the opposite and the adjacent. Right? So if I get that ratio, it's going to give me this factor. And what is the opposite over the adjacent? Well, it is, right, so Katoa, it is the tangent. So the tangent of, well, half of my field of view angle, that is going to give me this kind of scaling factor. So how big or how small I have to go and shrink or grow those x and y values. But there is just a small contradiction here. Let's think about this. We want a scaling factor, right? We want a factor that we can go and scale x's and y's, and then it's going to grow and shrink our objects. Basically, that's what we want. But the contradiction is this. Look at what I'm saying. The bigger the field of view, right? The bigger my angle of field of view, do you agree that I have to look and see more objects, right? I have to see more of my objects, meaning that the bigger the field of view, the smaller my objects have to be, so I can see more of them, and they occupy less space in the screen? Let me rephrase this. The bigger the angle of the field of view, the less my objects are going to be, right? The smaller my objects have to be because I have to see more of them. 
n also. The smaller my field of view, it's almost like I'm zooming in, right? The smaller my field of view, the bigger my objects have to be. They have to occupy more space in the screen, so I have to see less objects. So do you see how this contradiction is almost like the inverse, right? The bigger the field of view, the smaller my objects have to be, so I can see more of them. The smaller the field of view angle, the bigger my objects have to be, they have to occupy more space, so I see less of them. So the smaller the field of view, the bigger the objects. The bigger the field of view, the smaller the objects. This is inversely proportional. Right? So I can basically fix that by saying that my f field of view scaling factor has to be the inverse of the tangent of my angle divided by 2. That f right there is what we're going to use as this field of view scaling factor. So we're going to have to multiply that scaling factor f by x's and y's to shrink things or grow things. That is what we're going to use. This is going to be part of our projection matrix as well. So let's just put everything together. We have, from before, the aspect ratio, which was height divided by width. And now we have this f, which is the field of view scaling factor, which is 1 divided by the tangent of half of my field of view angle. So how do this all play a part in the transformation of my vertices? Well, if I have my original x, y, and z values in world space, to convert things into this image space, I have to multiply my x's by the aspect ratio and the field of view scaling factor, and my y only by the field of view scaling factor. Do you see where we're going with this? So these two scaling factors are going to have to multiply x, this scaling factor of the field of view has to multiply my y's. And now we have to also look at the z, because we have to think about that normalization, right? Keeping the values of z, mapping all those values of z into this kind of minus one to one value, right? Normalizing all those z values as well. So I want you to keep this thing here in mind. We're going to use, this is going to be part of our perspective projection matrix. So we have taken into account aspect ratio, done. We have taken into account field of view, done. Let's look at the normalization of my z component, right? We have to normalize the z values. And to start this discussion, right, to also think about normalizing the z values, let's say that we have all these objects in world space. They can be super far, super near. They have their original depth values, right? So we, regardless of where they are in space, they have this depth value. What I want to achieve is, I want to map all these objects between these values right here. And the way that I look at it, it's almost like I'm going to map these things. This is going to be my zero, and this has to be my one. Right? I have to map these things between this kind of zero and one. Everything that is in front of me is zero until one. We are going to have this concept of these two important planes in the z domain. We have something called z far, which is this plane way there, far from us, which is basically what is the maximum value that we can visualize in our 3D scene. That is what we call the z far plane, right? The thing way down in the distance, uh, we can only visualize things that are inside closer to the z far. And we also are going to have something very here close to us, which is our z near plane. And the z near plane is responsible for kind of determining uh, what is the closest value that we have to have inside our visualization, our 3D scene. So everything has to be between z near and z far. Well, the way I look at it is we have to normalize everything to this kind of 0 to 1, right? We have these values between 0 and 1 here, everything that is in front of me. I have to normalize these values. Very well, so we have to find a formula to take into account the z far, the z near, maybe the total distance, and then map everything into this kind of 0 and 1, right? It's minus 1 to 1 in image space. I am going to call this thing lambda. You could call it anything one. I'm just, I picked lambda just because. I am going to start by saying that if I get my z far and I divide by the total distance from z far to z near, right? This total length right here, z far minus z near, that is going to give me this kind of scaling factor, right? So if I go and I scaled everything from z far divided by z far minus z near, which is this total distance right here, 
that is going to give me this kind of scaling factor that is going to effectively adjust things, right, between these kind of zero and one normalized values. Not that bad, right? Kind of think it kind of makes sense. Intuitively, we understand that we have this z far divided by the total distance between z far minus in. But there is one thing missing, which is I also need to take into account the z near. And the z near, I have to basically just perform a little offset. Right? So I kind of I get this near and offset to take into account this near plane as well. And you will see that we only have to add a couple of extra terms here. So I am going to subtract, right? I'm going to offset, I'm going to account for this almost like a translation for accounting the zinir. So it is z far divided by z far minus zinir. Do you see how this thing right here is exactly the same as what we had before? So I had the same thing as before, but now multiplied by zinir. This second term right here, which I have to subtract, I have to offset, is what takes into account this zinir distance right here. I have to go and move things uh, inside the zinir. This is what I'm calling lambda. This is my scaling factor that is going to help us normalize this z, original z values. We want, look at what we want, eyes on the price. What we want is a value that we have to multiply by z, by the original z's. So after we perform the perspective divide, after we divide everything by z, the values are going to be all in this healthy range between 0 and 1. This is what this lambda is going to help us. So this lambda right here, the way I look at it, right? Now that we have aspect ratio scaling factor, we have the field of view scaling factor, and now we have this lambda scaling, normalizing scaling factor, I look at it, right? What do we have to do with x, y, and z? Converting everything into image space, I have to multiply x's by both a and f, done. I have to multiply y's by f, and I have to multiply my original z by that lambda thing that is going to normalize my z. Because after I multiply lambda, and then after I perform the perspective divide, then I'm going to have all these values, hopefully, between this kind of minus 1, 1, and then this z between z near and z far, this 0 to 1 values, right? Normalized. Whenever I say normalized, it's usually values that are in this kind of 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1 range. This is what usually normalized means in kind of graphics programming. Oh, good. There is a lot here, right? There's a lot packed in this lecture right here. There was a lot of details we learned about aspect ratio. We spoke about this field of view scaling factor. We have this z-normalization. I want to pause right now, and I want to look at how do we convert these operations right here, these multiplications by x, multiplication by y, and multiplication by z. How do we transform these? How do we encode this in matrix form? Because we know already the formulas that we have to multiply by x, y, and z. It's just a matter of going and kind of encoding this in matrix form, right? And we end up with these things right here. And I already color-coded everything. So do you see the aspect ratio is the high divided by the width, the field of view scaling factor, it is uh, the inverse of the tangent of half of my field of view angle. So this is what I have to multiply by my original x. The inverse of the tangent of the field of view divided by 2 is what I have to multiply by my original y's. And the z, I have to multiply by that whole ugly thing, right? Which is basically that uh, considering the z far, the distance to the z near, and then minus that offset for the z near. This is what's going to help us kind of normalize the values of the z after we divide, right? After the perspective divide. Very well. Look. This thing right here is what our perspective projection matrix needs to accomplish. We are only going to choose to represent the same thing into matrix form, meaning that we're going to have to find a matrix and we're going to have to populate the entries of that matrix in the correct places. So whenever we multiply that matrix by our vector, we achieve exactly the same thing that we're seeing right here. And you will see that it's not rocket science, it's super simple. All we have to do is find this matrix that you're seeing right here. And it's pretty easy to understand, right? Understanding that the matrix multiplication is the row times the column, plus the row times the column, the row times the column, we achieve at this result, which is the first row, right? That first term multiplied by x plus 0 plus 0 plus 0. 
and then the second row multiplied then multiplies by the y plus 0 plus 0. Do you see? By simple matrix multiplication, just by correctly placing these elements and formulas and uh, all these variables correctly placed in the correct entries of the matrix, matrix multiplication, just opening the row times the column, the row times the column, the row times the column, we are going to achieve exactly the same thing as before. Remember, I always wanted to look at this, I wanted to look beyond the matrix, right? A matrix is just a way of encoding and placing things in this tabular form. And we know that by multiplying these things, row times column, row times column, we are going to achieve the same multiplications and additions that we were doing before. That is how I wanted to look at matrices. It's just a different way of representing, of encoding the same thing. Very well. So this thing that you're seeing right here is our projection matrix. We're going to go in our code, we're going to open a function that goes and populates the correct values, right? The first position with that value, the second position with the field of view value, and then we're going to have a value for Zifar, a value for Zinir, we're going to subtract everything, and then everything we just place in the correct elements. That is pretty much what we need. Just keep that in mind. Let's just move here to the next slide. I'm just kind of shrinking a little bit our projection matrix with those values. We need to find a way of encoding that projection matrix. We need to create this projection matrix. So we go and we multiply by every vertex of our 3D scene. And I'm going to already show how I think that should look. This thing right here that you're seeing on the screen, this is our matrix for make perspective. I'm going to add one more function to our arsenal, which is called mat for make perspective. And do you see how we have the freedom of passing? What is the float field of view angle? What is the float aspect ratio that we have? And what is the float z near and the float z far? So we can pass this as parameter. And then this function is going to be responsible for creating a matrix and populating in the correct elements there, in the correct entries, the formulas that we have before. So if you look here in this first four lines, I just added some comments. This is exactly just a translation of how our matrix is going to look like. So this is basically the same as this thing up here. So let's look here. Matrix M position 0, 0. It is, look at up there in the position 0, 0. It is the aspect ratio, right? H divided by W, which is our parameter that we receive, aspect ratio times 1 divided the tangent of the field of view divided by 2. Simple, right? Basically just a direct translation of what we have in that position. Right, so what about position 1, 1? It is just the inverse of the tangent of the angle divided by 2, exactly what we have right here. What is position 2, 2? Well, position 2, 2 is this one right here. It is the z far divided by z far minus in here. Absolutely, so that scaling factor. And then position 2, 3 is this thing right here, which is minus z far uh, times in here, right? I just multiply here the numerator, divided by the total z far minus in here. That's it. Okay, Gustavo, there's still one thing, right, that you mentioned, that 1.0 at position, the fourth row, third column. Why do we have a 1 there? Well, I don't know if you noticed, but where is perspective divide in this whole thing here? Do you see how our projection matrix, our perspective projection matrix, does not perform the perspective divide? Do you remember how the perspective divide is that thing that goes and divides x and y's by the z? component, we have to create this perspective, right? Things that are closer are bigger, things that are far away are smaller. Where is that division by z? And you are right, we do not perform perspective divide in our perspective projection matrix. The perspective divide happens after. So we are going to divide, it's going to be separate. We are going to first create the perspective, we multiply the perspective projection matrix by our vertices and only after we perform the perspective divide. And there is a reason for that, because some things happen between the perspective projection and the perspective divide. And we're going to learn what those things are very soon in our course. So there are some steps that are going to happen between this projection and the actual perspective divide, where we go and we divide everything by Z.
But just to give you a spoiler of how these things are going to work, I have that thing right there. So the reason why I have that one in that position is because we are going to save, we are going to store, we are going to create a backup of the original unchanged Z component value inside the W of my resulting vertex. Do you agree that we're going to have this homogeneous, right, with four dimensions here, this vertex at the end? And I am going to choose to save. We're going to have that one right there, because by multiplying that one by these values, I'm going to multiply that one by Z, and I store on the fourth row, which is the W. So I am going to effectively store, I'm going to create a backup, I'm going to save that original, unchanged, unnormalized Z value. The one before everything, we're going to save the Z value of our objects in the W component of our vector. Gustavo, why are we going to do that? Well, because this original Z value is going to be super important for us in the future. We don't want to lose it because there are things that we need to perform with texturing. Whenever we create a perspective texture correction, we need to use that original unchanged, unnormalized, unmodified Z value. That is why I go there and I put a one in that position because then it multiplies by Z and saves it in the fourth row, the W. Okay? And just so you understand, look at this code right here, I am going to have a new function, which I'm just creating a function which is responsible for multiplying my vector by the projection matrix and also performing the perspective divide right here. So this is just already a snippet of code for you to see how we multiply the projection matrix by my vertices and also perform the perspective divide here at the bottom. So look at what this function is telling us. I'm calling this function matrix4 multiply vec4 and project. So I'm, I receive the projection matrix as parameter and I receive my v vector. First, the first thing I do is I multiply the projection matrix by our original vector v which is, I just have to call mat4 multiply vec4, so I multiply a matrix by a vec4, which is this mat proj and v. I pass these two things, I get a result. The result of this multiplication is taking into account aspect ratio, field of view, and z normalization scaling factor. Right? So this is what I did with this perspective projection multiplication. And then after that, I go to the perspective divide stage, which is, here is where I perform perspective divide with the original Z value that is now stored in W. Do you see where we're going with this? See how I'm checking. If the result dot W, which has my original Z value, is different than 0.0, .0 so I just want to prevent division by zero, result dot X, I divide by result.w, so I am performing the perspective divide, dividing everything by the z component, but I'm using what is stored in w. So I divide x's and y's by the original z vector, which I just stored in the w component. So I divide x's by w, divide y by w, and I divide the z as well by w, reaching that normalization that I want. After we create this perspective divide, by adjusting all those normalization scaling factors and everything, I hope to see this result value to have those values in that range of minus one and one. Right? So this is where, after the perspective divide, this is where I get my normalized things in this kind of image space that I want. Right? That cube-like thing that has uh, all the values between minus one and one in both x, y, and z. And this is something that I want you to always remember, the perspective projection stage of our graphics pipeline.